recording. Uh, hello? I don't know who's going to be watching this. Uh, me and my assistant Richard over there, we just uh, survived a crash on this island. Uh, uh, we're both okay. We're all fine. We're not hurt. I found this helpful book in someone's luggage. Uh, Scout Master Meyer's Guide on How Not to Die. So, uh, seems apropos in this situation. Uh, rule zero, leave no one behind. Easily enough, we'll be out here in no time. So I think the plan is to grab a couple of flares and we're going to try and climb to the top of that mountain back there. Light them up. Hopefully people will see us. Come pick us up. Yeah, yeah. Foot right there. Uh-huh. Hand right there. Keep it coming. I got gotcha. you. All right. Here we go. No man left behind, right? Oh, we're getting close. Uh, just over this tall ridge here, I think we'll be all set. Maybe, Richard, I'll, I'll boost you up, and then you can drop down some rope and help me. Yeah, all right. Let's give it a shot. Ready? Huh, huh. Yep, yep. Just like that. All right. Teamwork. How's it looking up there, Richard? Good? Good. All right. Drop some rope down, and I'll come up and meet you. Richard? R R Richard, the rope. Richard? Richard? The rope! No, 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 you, you, would, no, you wouldn't do that. No, Richard, I know. I know you wouldn't do that, Richard. I know you can hear me. Richard! Richard! The rope! He left me. He left me behind. Richard! You left me behind! You knew the rules. I told you the rules, Richard. But you left me! I don't know if anyone will ever find this recording. I want you to give a message to Richard. Tell him, when he dies, I will be waiting for you, buddy. <laughs> Ghosts are real? Oh, oh, Richard! Oh, Richard! Hey, buddy, remember me? Oh, that's right, I'm back! You thought you could get rid of me that easily? Nah, remember rule number one, Richard? Leave no one behind, so I'm taking you down with me! <laughs> hey, uh... Why don't we just light the flares on the beach? Peak has made quite the splash as the next in line of multiplayer games that follow the simple formula of funny physics plus proximity voice chat equals comedy goldmine. For those who haven't played it, the premise is simple. You and your buddies have crashed on a deserted island with a massive volcano. Your goal is to climb to the very top so you can signal a helicopter and get rescued. Sounds simple. But getting there alive is, well, easier said than done. Now, your first instinct may be to question why every single plane from Bing Bong Airlines goes down on a very similar island. But I mean, look, maybe there's just a Scotsman in a bunker somewhere around here who slept through his alarm to turn off a big magnet. But we don't know, okay? Maybe it's not Bing Bong's fault, people. Or, I mean, you know, maybe it is. It's a, it's a pretty bad track record. But after playing this game for a while, another question came to mind. Why are we climbing again? Would it really increase your odds of getting rescued? Or would you have been better off staying on the beach? Today, I'm breaking down all the science to find out. This is How to Survive Peak. Richard left me behind without a second thought so uh i don't know i guess we just uh continue with the video so you've just survived bing bong airlines 1000th crash uh, congratulations by the way you actually win a free mug for that you're stranded on an island with a massive volcano and no sign of any human civilization so what do you do the game suggests that you grab some signal flares, get to the highest point you can, and light them up so any nearby aircraft can see you and come pick you up. And that seems to make logical sense. If you're high up, closer to where the planes and helicopters fly, they're more likely to see your flare. But, and I really do hate to be the bearer of bad news here, that long and arduous climb up the volcano where you had to watch one of your friends sink into the lava and earn your 
resourcefulness badge with another might not have been entirely necessary. The volcano from peak is listed as being 1,920 meters, or about 1.2 miles tall. The game provides you with a couple of flares to try and signal an aircraft with. So the question becomes, how far can these flares be seen? Well, it can vary depending on the type of flare and the weather conditions, but on a clear sunny day, a handheld flare can be seen up to three miles away, or nearly 5,000 meters. And we know from the game that the helicopter that finds you is around 2,000 meters above the ground, well within the range that they would have been able to see your flare from the ground. Who would have guessed the things that were designed to signal people from far away can be seen from pretty far away. But of course, that's only in ideal conditions. What if it's stormy or foggy out? What if the craft you're trying to signal is on the other side of the mountain blocking the line of sight? In those cases, it would be advantageous to climb to higher ground where there's more visibility. However, as we see in the game, that also comes with its own dangers. So, you have a decision to make. Do you stay by the beach and risk search planes missing you, or do you try climbing higher and risk falling 12 stories to your death because your so-called friend ditched you like a hot sack of sh Well, if you want to maximize your odds of being rescued, it would probably help if you knew what your future rescuer's plan was. Luckily, that plan is well documented in the International Aeronautical and Maritime Search and Rescue Manual, published by the United Nations. And let me tell you, it is a real page turner, that IAMSAR, all 248 pages of it. Look, I don't normally do this, but please subscribe. It helps ease the pain. Whenever a plane fails to show up for a scheduled check-in, disappears from radar, or sends out a distress call of some sort, an SAR plan goes into effect and a rescue team will immediately begin looking for survivors. First, they'll try and locate any electronic distress beacons. Every aircraft comes equipped with an emergency locator beacon that can send out radio SOS signals in the event of a crash. When a rescue team picks up these signals, they can quickly locate the crashed aircraft and be there in a matter of hours. For that reason, it's generally advised that you stay near the site of the crash. That way, when the rescue team finds the beacon in the wreckage of the plane, you'll already be right there. You could also potentially use the wreckage of the plane as a temporary shelter, assuming it's safe and not like on fire or anything, and you can easily gather food and supplies from any luggage lying around. If all goes well, you could just have a chill few hours on the beach munching on some trail mix until a helicopter comes to pick you up. If you choose to climb, not only do you have to deal with the dangerous and unknown geography of the island, you're also actively moving away from the first place the rescue team will look. However, it's important to note that these beacons are not foolproof. As it turns out, designing a device that can survive an incredibly chaotic and destructive event like a plane crash is pretty hard. In fact, certain studies have found that these beacons only activate in around half of crashes and are only successful in helping rescue teams locate a crash 40% of the time. Luckily, if you can find the beacon after the crash, it's pretty easy to tell if it's working or not. They're typically stored in the tail section of the plane and will have a manual attached that explains how to run a quick test. If you can't find the beacon or it's not working, don't worry, you're not out of luck, but you might want to get a little more comfortable. In the event that no beacon is detected, the next step is to begin a manual search pattern. The rescue team will start at the last point of contact with the plane and begin searching for any physical evidence of the crash. Once they locate the site of the crash, they can narrow their search to that area to begin looking for survivors. And once again, 
if you're already hanging out by the crash site, they won't have far to look. Planes are highly reflective and cause some pretty noticeable damage to the natural landscape when they crash, so they tend to stick out a bit more than a single guy with a flare would. So, whether the emergency beacon is working or not, the actual site of the plane crash is probably going to be the first thing that the rescue team finds. If you want to help them out and make yourself a bit more noticeable from the air, you could try to build a signal fire or a big SOS sign like they all made fun of Bernard for in Lost. Look, I promise I won't keep referencing that show, but it's a video about a plane crash on a deserted island. What do you want me to do? At that point, just sit tight, stay safe, ration your food and water, and wait for someone to come and find you. With any luck, you won't have gone down far from your flight path, and someone will spot you within a day. It turns out that, in this game about climbing, the best thing you can do is stay on the ground. You left a comment about the fog, didn't you? All of this is assuming that the rescue team will be able to find the crash site. But what if they can't find it? Anyone who's taken a little too long trying to get that chest way over there will probably know about one more oddity of this island. The fog. After a certain amount of time spent on the island, a thick layer of fog will begin to rise, slowly consuming the mountain and, if you're not fast enough, dooming you to a cold and icy death. Now on the surface, this seems like nothing more than a game mechanic to get you to hurry up, not necessarily an attempt to be realistic. However, it turns out that this phenomenon is far more true to life than you might think. Well, the fog part at least, not the, it's not that cold. It's called a marine layer. And if you live on the west coast of the United States, you're very familiar with it. When the temperature of the water is significantly colder than the air, it can cool the air to the point of condensation, resulting in low-lying clouds or fog. It's most common in the morning after a particularly cold night, and it usually clears up as the day goes on and the sun reheats the air. This fog can reach upwards of 1,500 meters into the air and completely obscure the ground, enough to cover most of the mountain like we see in Peak. Now, if the electronic transmitter beacon is working, this isn't a problem. A rescue team will be able to find you, even if they can't see you. And unlike the game, you're not going to freeze to death from a little fog. Just ask the entire city of San Francisco. It happens there all the time. But if the beacon isn't working, this fog will make it very hard for planes in the air to see the wreckage. And by proxy, you. And in that very specific case that we happen to see in-game, surely it would be advisable to get to higher ground above the fog where you have more visibility and can signal for help, right? Right? Just let me climb, man! Well, even in this very specific case, it's still a no. First, just because a rescue team can't see you from the air, doesn't mean they won't be able to find you, right? If a plane flies over an area and can't see what's below them, they're not going to just assume there's nothing down there. They'll come back on another day when it's clear to confirm. And if they know there is an island down there, they may even send in a ground team to investigate within the fog. So even in this case, you're still better off setting up camp in or near the wreck. However, if the fog is incredibly persistent and you're worried that a rescue team will never find you, there are a few things you can do to help them out. If you have a group of survivors, you may want to consider sending out a small scouting party to scope out the area and see if there's any easily accessible high ground. And now make sure to leave some people behind who know where you went, 
so that if a rescue team shows up while you're gone, they know to wait for you. If you happen to be completely alone, it's probably not worth venturing too far. But if you do, leave some sort of sign or message at the wreck in case anyone turns up and clearly mark your trail so they can come find you. If you do venture out, be very careful not to injure yourself since you probably don't have any proper medical supplies. And while you may be tempted, never climb up something that you couldn't easily get back down from. You'll want to be able to return to your camp safely and easily before nightfall. In addition to any food and supplies, you're going to want to look for areas of high elevation above the thickest areas of fog that are easy to get to. Now, don't try to relocate your whole camp up there, it's not worth the risk. Instead, you can try to create a signal fire or bring some highly reflective pieces from the wreck that may be visible from the sky and leave it in a more exposed area. If the rescue team finds this, they can easily follow the trail back to your camp and get you out of there. So you know what? Go ahead and toss Scoutmaster Meyer's guidebook aside because I got some new rules for you. Stay safe, stay put, and stay together. You hear that, Richard? If the helicopter comes, I'm telling him you fell in the lava, all right? So, there you have it. Everything you need to know for surviving a plane crash on a deserted island. You know, I feel like most of my videos, you come away learning something that you'll probably never need to know. And this is maybe the first time where you learn something that you'll hopefully never need to know. But until next time, I'll see you in another life, brother. Look, I had to get just one more in there. Come on, let me have this. And a huge thank you to all my supporters on Patreon, including Alex, Alakazam, Aspa102, Big Dog Tie for to Win, Captain Kirby, Sidian, Sherry and Mark, Stylish, The Boss Killer 94, Tie Studio, and Moki Yubu. Mm -hmm.